Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Christina Wilson. Uh, I'm very lucky that she said yes to doing this today. And then I was so excited because she called me and we had this great conversation about female athletes. She actually introduced Dr. Shaba to me. Um, she had a bunch of other recommendations. So this may not be the last time we talk about female athlete in this environment uh, because there's a lot of great work being done even here locally. So Dr. Christina Wilson is a pediatric primary care sports medicine physician at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Upon completing her fellowship in sports medicine at Vanderbilt, she returned to Phoenix to develop and grow the pediatric sports medicine program at Phoenix Children's Hospital. She earned her master's in public health with an emphasis in public health practice from the University of Arizona. She serves as the Medical Director for Adolescent and Pediatric Sports Medicine and Sports Physical Therapy at Phoenix Children's Hospital and as the co-director of the Pediatric Brain Injury and Concussion Program at Barrow Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital. For almost 15 years, she has served as a medical director for several Arizona high schools. Dr. Wilson was recently appointed by the AIA as the chair of the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, where she has served as an active member of the committee for the past six years. Under her direction, she has navigate, navigated the COVID pandemic for a safe return for student athletes in Arizona and is now working on identifying and providing resources for student athletes struggling with mental health disorders. She is also a mother of three athletic children, two of them female, so she can definitely relate to the unique concerns of the female athlete. Please welcome Dr. Christina Wilson. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all of you coming this morning. It's like kind of fun to have a bigger live audience these days. So this is exciting. Um, I wanted to kind of take a little different take on this this morning. So a lot of times you come to a female athlete talk and everyone talks about Red S and that's like all you hear about, which is a huge disservice, I think, to athletes in general, um, because there's a lot of other things, you know, Red S definitely, as Dr. Shaba even talked about, um, is very prevalent in the, in the female athlete population, but there is so many more things that affect injury rates and other things. And I was really excited actually to see the question list of many of you who registered because there was only like two questions on that and probably 15 questions on other things, which I was like, great, because that's what I decided to talk about this morning. So it really worked out well. Um, and I'm pretty informal. So if you guys have questions along the way, like feel free to like interject and just, and just say, but we'll also have kind of a question and answer session at the end too. All right. So um, the objectives for this morning are really first to just kind of identify some um, factors that affect sports performance in female athletes. Uh, secondly, to list unique aspects to the female anatomy that contribute to injury risk. Um, because there are some things that are structurally different in the female body versus the male body. Um, to discuss equity and equality issues for women in sports. I think this is a huge area that we have to start talking about. Um, because this actually does affect the healthcare and the medical care of our athletes. And, you, and when you talk to many female athletes, particularly in the um, professional and even in the collegiate arena, many of them have tried to transition the vernacular away from being the female athlete or female athletes. Um, because really they're like, we're all athletes. And why do we have to be female athletes? We don't identify male athletes as being male athletes, but we always identify and put the female like thing before female athletes. And they just want to be athletes in general. And I think most of us have been there. Many of us, you know, go into sports medicine because we were athletes ourselves as well. Um, and then lastly, just to develop prevention strategies to reduce injuries in athletes. So when we look at factors affecting women in sports, um, I kind of looked, broke this up into kind of four areas that we're going to touch on this morning. The first is physiology um, and anatomy. Second is discrimination. Um, and so we'll talk about those sort of sensitive topics to talk about. Um, uniform and equipment. Definitely there are things that are different about the female body that affect our uniform. Also, how the media projects and portrays the female athlete is very different than the male athlete. Um, and so we'll talk and touch on the media because this actually plays into a lot of what Dr. Shaba talked about with stressors that affect female athletes athletes and other things as well. So when we look at physiology, there's really kind of um, four major areas, and actually there's a fifth one that I added later, but cardiovascular, bone and ligaments, strength, and endurance. 
So when we look at cardiovascular fitness, um, kind of the two things that sort of are very different in female versus males um, is when we look at VO2 max, which is the maximum oxygen consumption. So this is really the, the definition of kind of VO2 max is the oxygen consumption remains steady despite an increase in exercise intensity. So it's sort of when you reach that like that plateau point um, where you're not consuming more oxygen, but you can actually increase your aerobic capacity um, and the exercise intensity. And it's directly related to body size. So typically, males have bigger body size than females. And so that affects VO2 max um, a little bit. And then really the other thing that plays into this a lot is that hemoglobin levels are different in males and females. It's very slightly, um, but that slight difference um, has a different oxygen carrying capacity. Um, and so female um, hemoglobin levels are slightly lower than male hemoglobin levels. And so that can play a, a part into that cardiovascular fitness as well for females. Um, we look at bone and ligament, so longer and larger bones absolutely provide a mechanical advantage. So I don't specify this as males or females and that, you know, when you look at the literature, sometimes they'll be like, oh, well, female athletes like are, have a disadvantage because they're smaller in size. Many of us know females who are very large, who are the same size as a male. And so really, I like to kind of talk about this as if you have larger and longer bones, you're going to have that mechanical advantage. And so we definitely see athletes that migrate into many of those strength sports when they they do have bigger bodies. Um, and so they have greater leverage um, and they also have a wider frame to support more muscle. And so it's easier to kind of increase that muscle mass when you have a larger body um, and larger bones to, to put that on. Um, but the density of bone is different between male and female as well. And there are definitely things when we talk about disordered eating or red S that's very important to kind of target and talk about those younger female athletes. Because when we are less than 20, that is the only time in our life when we are really able to actually increase our bone density. So if we're we're doing things where we're not fueling our body during that time to not increase that bone density. We're doing a disservice to us when we get into our 20s and 30s when we start to all naturally lose bone density. And so that conversation is very important. Um, and we do a great job of kind of talking with athletes about how to participate and how to play their sport. We do a terrible job of teaching them how to fuel their body for their sport. Um, and so really, we always in our clinic kind of have an emphasis of talking with our kids about nutrition. I think you guys have a great role when you're at physical therapy um, or when you're with them in an athletic training room to talk about that nutritional component. What did you eat for breakfast? And they can't remember, that's a problem. Um, you know, what did you eat for lunch today? And many of our athletes, you know, I actually am a medical director of a, um, of a South Phoenix school that is a very um, underserved area. And it oftentimes is like, oh, I just had the team meal right before the game. And I'm like, awesome. Let's kind of work on maybe some things that we can have, like, you know, some fruit in our backpack or other things that we can take with us to school or getting school breakfast that's free in the morning um, and, to, and do those things. Um, but, and then also just structurally, the woman's body is different. And so we'll talk about this when it comes to flexibility, which is the other part that I added. Um, women have a wider pelvis um, and that actually our hips and our hip joints are actually different, which then uh, plays into our entire lower extremity um, and how we build strength there. <clears throat> And then also that leads to a lower center of gravity, which is advantageous in balance things. So you look at sports where females migrate to, we tend to sort of migrate to places where that balance is, of a, is an advantage to us. Low. So you look at like gymnastics or you look at figure skating, those things where there's basically balance is a huge part of the sport. <clears throat> So this is just looking at flexibility. So a lot of times I hear, you know, my male athletes particularly come into clinic and they're like, oh, I've never been flexible and I can't be flexible. It's not true. Everybody can be flexible. There are different degrees of flexibility, obviously, and some of those are structural. So we definitely know a larger muscle mass is going to limit the movement that you have around a joint. So if you have really large and very, um, you know, robust hamstrings, your knee flexion is going to be limited because there's going to be a structural, you know, thing that gets in the way. Um, and so, you know, typically the reason that males have been toted to have less flexibility is because what we, how we train males is to be strong. And so we focus on the strength part of things and we don't necessarily focus on that flexibility component, whereas women are very different and we focus, you know, on increasing the number of reps, decreasing the amount of weight. And so we, we train athletes differently. So some of this has been what we have structurally in a social construct we have created to make our athletes look different. Um, but definitely from a pelvis structure and just the bone structure, you can see the female pelvis is definitely wider. Um, the sacrum is actually uplifted and back. And all of these structural changes to the pelvis are for one thing. And I talk about my adolescent athletes all the time and we joke about it in clinic. I tell them, you know, these things happen to you at your age not 
for convenience for you, but really so that 20 years, you know, hopefully for your parents' sake, 20 years from now, you can be a mom if you want to someday. Like these are all anatomic adaptations that we as females have in order to carry a fetus and to be able to deliver that baby. Um, and that's really the only purpose, but it creates problems a little bit for us when we look at sort of training and strength and, and other things and flexibility. Um, but one thing it does help with is flexibility. So if you look at how when that pelvis is widened, um, you can see the acetabulum where the pelvis basically, where the femur comes into it, those are further apart. Um, and they're further apart, and it also, um, the acetabulum isn't as deep because of that. So we actually have increased range of motion that we have available to us from a bony construct in our, in our hips um, that males don't actually have. So we would expect that females actually have greater range of motion, and we see that oftentimes um, when we're doing range of motion. And so there are some structural reasons why flexibility will cap at a certain point for different sexes. Um, when we look at sort of just the limitations to flexibility, muscle mass is kind of the biggest and, and really the stiffness is really what contributes to decreased flexibility. And most of the stiffness comes from the joint capsule and, and, um, and then the ligaments. And so those are areas where sometimes we don't have control over doing as much to kind of lengthen or do that. The other thing is that when we look at ligaments, we don't have the, we aren't able to kind of sustain that flexibility. Like you can do it for short periods of time, but it doesn't last and it's not a place that you can build it. So really the target area we should be looking at when we're trying to build flexibility in any athlete is really looking at the muscle fascia because that's where about another 40% of that flexibility comes from. And that's where you can actually train to elongate the muscle and to teach those actin and myosin. I won't take you all the way back to anatomy, um, but basically those that's where we can actually really target to basically build that flexibility. And that's in any athlete across the board. Um, and then 10% comes from the stiffness in the tendons. The other thing though, that's actually unique is that obviously Dr. Shaba talked about it too with just mental health, but females have, and males have different hormones. So we all have the same hormones, but we have different levels of those hormones and those hormones basically peak and, and go down at different levels and they're definitely much more labile in females than they are in males. But one hormone that um, is really kind of in its infancy a little bit, there's been a lot of research done over the last 10 or 15 years with relaxin. Um, and relaxin is very interesting because there's been a lot of studies and there's a few studies that have basically shown that it definitely affects injury rates and other things, but no one has sort of followed up on a lot of those studies. This is an area that is very ripe for a lot of research. Um, and so relaxin we find actually in ACL fibers. We find it actually in the labrum of the hip. Um, and we know that basically relaxin is um, at the luteal phase, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the female menstrual cycle. In the luteal phase, which is basically after you ovulate, that relaxin increases very high in all women. So this is when I talk with a lot of my adolescent runners about when they're running and they start to have pelvic obliquity issues and they start to have basically that upslip or that rotational, um, it will often comes out, come out when they're in the luteal phase. And so sometimes we can track it monthly um, when we're first starting to try to build that strength. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how we can talk, um, how we can build strength during certain phases of the menstrual cycle as well, which is kind of an interesting um, phenomenon. Um, but relaxin is also in males. It's just not at the same height. And so what we don't know is why it basically, we know why it peaks in females. It peaks because we need to have ligamentous laxity and that's what relaxin does. It loosens, it loosens those ligaments so it allows us to basically be able to have our pelvis widen even further when we're carrying a fetus and to deliver that baby. Um, but before that, it just creates lots of problems with low back pain, pelvic obliquity, and all those other things that we talk about sometimes in the female athlete. Um, but males also have it. And so why is it that, you know, and I'll talk about some research that was done with the NCAA athletes. Why is it that we see that in athletes, in female athletes, when it's very high, that they'll have ACL, that there's an increased risk of ACL ruptures and other things, whereas we don't see that same thing happen in males. And part of it we think is they don't have the fluctuations in relaxin that, that females do. Um, and then overall, just in general, flexibility decreases with age. So if those of you who take care of like itty bitty athletes, like I do, um, you will very much see that they are very sloppy and loosey goosey and they're kind of all over the place. And then as they get older and go through adolescence, they start to tighten up and it typically happens around the, the growth, the growth spurt. And part of it is they're not stretching as much as they need to, to kind of the bones grow much quicker than the tendons and muscles stretch out. And so really that is a, a very ripe, time to really work on teaching adolescents to kind of be stretching morning when they wake up and night before they go to bed that just helps to kind of keep up with that so they don't have some of the other injuries that we see that kind of happen um, at those times with um, during growth. 
So we look at strength. Um, really, strength comes about for sort of two things. So there's definitely we know that when there's a higher ratio of muscle mass to body weight, it allows for greater speed and acceleration. Um, and so when we look at speed records, um, you know, this is where males versus females at kind of that Olympic and that collegiate athlete, that collegiate level. Um, it's really about 10, the women are 10% slower than men. And that has stayed very consistent since the 80s. So even when men have gotten faster, women have gotten faster and it's been at the same cadence, which has been, which is very interesting. And so there is definitely, when we look at, you know, muscle mass to body weight, but when you look at, you know, women who have a higher muscle mass to body weight, that's more similar to men. Those are definitely people who are faster than women who are not. So it's not necessarily just this inherent thing to men and women. It really has to do with that muscle mass to body weight. It's just that you see the bigger contrast of that between men and, and women um, in general. And then the strength um, is about two thirds less um, um, with less muscle mass. And so when you have lower muscle mass, your strength is about two thirds less than those people with greater muscle mass. Um, and, and so we'll see that as well. And then the other thing is um, there's decreased core strength across, if you have decreased core strength, you're gonna have an increased risk of injuries. And that happens in males or females. And so this is not, females just get targeted for this a lot because females tend to have lower core strength where we don't emphasize and work on it as much. And so you're gonna see a lot where I talk about part of this is we've created this social construct for, and this is the problem for ourselves. So we really need to look at how we're training athletes and how we're doing that and do it very equitably across all athletes and giving them the opportunities to be able to do it as well. We look at endurance. This is where actually females tend to do a little bit better. Um, and the reason for that is that this is really determined by the body's efficiency um, when converting calories into energy. And so women um, do metabolically do a much better job and are much more efficient with converting glycogen to energy. So that's the secondary store. So glucose is your first you know, burst. That's the quick burst. And then we convert into glycogen. So women convert over to glycogen much quicker. And so we get to that threshold much higher. And so endurance sports are actually where women excel. Um, and these are the only sports where actually when you look at ultra running events and ultra, um, so things longer than a marathon, that is actually where you see the playing field level where women and men actually compete against each other. And there's not a separation of men versus women. And oftentimes women will outdo and outperform men. Um, and this is because we actually like are able to um, be much more efficient in getting into that longer energy store. And so we don't have the crash um, that everyone else will. Um, so as I mentioned before, the menstrual cycle. So there's really kind of two key phases. We're not going to go into this in a great detail because I could spend forever talking about sort of some of the effects here. Um, but really the two key phases are your follicular phase and then your luteal phase. So the follicular phase is basically what happens prior to ovulation and then ovulation happens. And so basically the follicular phase is after menstruation until the ovulation. And then the luteal phase is after ovulation until menstruation. Um, and so there are definitely changes that we have in hormones during this time. And so we know that different peaks in hormones affect us training wise um, from a female athlete perspective. And the other thing that I mentioned is, so when we look at relaxin, as I mentioned, this little area right here, which is in the luteal phase, is where relaxin peaks. Um, and it peaks up until um, we have menstruation. And if we, and the reason it's peaking there is because that's the time where if there is fertilization of that egg, you will basically carry a pregnancy and then relaxin increases even more because then you have it produced also um, by the placenta. Um, and so um, that's why pregnant women have a lot of ligamentous laxity and other things. We also know that low levels of estrogen and progesterone increase ligamentous laxity. So this is where a lot of people have targeted looking at is that, you know, in that early follicular phase where you have low estrogen and progesterone, is that where we see more commonly issues with ligamentous laxity? Is that where, you know, our recurrent shoulder dislocators or our patellar subluxors like come out more frequently? And are there things that we can target and do during that time to really affect that to help kind of stabilize those joints during those phases? So I wanna kind of pivot a little bit to just epidemiology of injury, because we definitely see that there are like higher rates of injury, certain types of injuries and in certain sports, um, when you look at males versus females. Um, and so when we, in the current literature that we have now, and so when you look at the literature, ankle and knee injuries are higher for women in the same sport. So when you look at soccer, definitely ankle and knee injuries are higher in soccer. This is why everyone has looked for a long time about what are those key components that cause ACL injuries to happen in basketball 
basketball and, and soccer higher in women than they do in males. Like, what is it about women that is different? Um, and that's what we struggled with for a little while trying to figure out. Females are four to six times more likely than males to have an acute knee injury in the same sport. Um, that's huge. That's a big difference between those two sports. Um, and then this is what I had mentioned before. So the study, there was a study done actually several years ago um, of NCAA athletes, and it demonstrated if a player's peak relaxin level was above a certain threshold, and this is just measured by a serum sample, um, their risk was four times higher to have an ACL rupture um, than people's who were not above that threshold. So we definitely you know, are considering relaxing, playing a, playing a role in there and there being a component that um, it might be affecting that as well. So I, I briefly talked about this a little bit. This is a very cool thing that I think is very interesting and somebody asked questions about it. So I think it's great that you guys are kind of in tune with this a little bit too. Um, so looking at training cycles um, and looking at training cycles and training females differently based on their, menstru their menstrual cycle. Um, we definitely know that there are estrogen boost days. So as I mentioned before, estrogen is kind of elevated um, in that luteal phase. And so when you look at that estrogen peak, we know that that's the time that basically strength and conditioning is gonna be, we can actually, as females, are usually stronger during that phase. So they've done studies looking at that where when, when women's levels of estrogen are higher, they are actually able to um, have increased strength um, and actually can train harder and build muscle faster and better during that time. And then you have increased flexibility during the luteal phase. Um, and so the interesting thing about this is you have increased flexibility during that time, but that's also when relaxin is peaking. Um, and so you have increased ligamentous laxity during that time as well. And so um, that probably contributes a little bit to that, but then also on the beginning of the phase of your menstrual cycle in that early follicular phase, you also, that's when estrogen and progesterone are very low, um, you have increased flexibility during that time. And so when you're looking at sort of trying to increase flexibility, so for instance, gymnasts or, you know, like our aesthetic sports, our figure skaters, and they're trying to increase their flexibility, those are very key times of when it would be great to really work on overstretching them during that time. Um, because that's where you can make bigger gains because they have increased flexibility already and then you can work um, towards doing that and maintaining that. And so just kind of an interesting thing to sort of think about. Um, it's hard to do that because everyone's menstrual cycle is a little bit different. And so what we have, we don't have the magic bullet of is being able to be like, you know, if we did, everyone could pick when they want to get pregnant. That doesn't happen for those of you who've been a mom. Um, we try, but it doesn't work. That's another thing that affects female athletes as well. But it's, when you look at that, it's if we could really predict menstrual cycles, so it's great for the athletes who are like, I have a very regimented cycle. It's this perfect 28 day cycle. And we know that on day 14, they're going to ovulate. And then we we can map out their menstrual cycle and you can cyclic train them. Um, but it's really hard to do because most people do not fall into that pattern of actually having this perfect like menstrual phase and menstrual cycle. So we look at prevention. Um, there are definitely things that we need done. And this is where I'm going to challenge you sort of at the end of this presentation, because, you know, when we look at even just the social determinants of health and how we've looked at certain marginalized populations and, you know, COVID brought a lot of this um, to the forefront about looking at how we care for certain populations and how we've done research on doing things. And we've been very biased in our research. Sports medicine is not unaffected. And so when we look at sort of, um, you know, prevention activities and when we look at sort of the female athlete and when we've typed these athletes here, some of this is, I think we have, we possibly have done this to ourselves. You know, when we look at how we train athletes, it's very different how we train female athletes and the opportunities that are given to female athletes versus male athletes. Um, and so I mentioned some of that. And so really leg strength, um, these are just things in general, whether you're a male or female or athlete that we know are protective for lower extremity injuries. So leg strength, and you really have to train those muscles in isolation first and then work on functionally training them. And so moving into more complex movements like squats, lunges, split squats, and deadlifts. Um, also looking at increased core stability. So I have this time of year, a, you know, coming into, we're getting ready for baseball season, coming into the spring, they already start trickling into my office. And, you know, even our baseball players, I can tell you everyone who's gonna have little league elbow and little league shoulder because they all have horrible core stability. That doesn't matter that they're male or female. If you cannot, if you don't have good core stability, you are going to like abuse your shoulder and your elbow. Uh, and so we see the same thing. And so really working on core stability where we don't a lot of, have, a lot of times have that good core stability in female athletes. Um, and then looking at plyometrics. Um, so, you know, bilateral to unilateral hopping movements um, and rep, then replicating like sports demands. And so really training athletes for the sport and what load you're going to put on them that they they need. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, this is still very, you know, in its infancy, I think. Um, we, we just don't have enough research, but we definitely have some that's very promising. Looking at hormonal contraceptives um, with relaxin levels. So there was another NCAA study that was done that's actually really cool. Um, and this one actually, then there was also a high school study, but there was a high school study that was done first on 15 to 19 year old females. They were 63% less likely to tear an ACL if they were on oral contraceptives. And the follow-up study to that was an NCAA study that basically looked at relaxin levels and they found that after three months of being on an oral contraceptive, relaxin levels were undetectable. So we can sort of eliminate that surge and they don't need it because like I mentioned before, we have that to like conceive. If they're not interested in conceiving and they're not going down that road and they're really just focused on their, their athletics, like this is something that's huge. If we can eliminate that risk with that relaxin and that relaxin really plays into, you know, labral pathology that we see in the hips, ACL issues that we see in the knees, it'll make a big difference on, you know, many things that in careers for female athletes. So, I'm gonna pivot this talk a little bit. These are sort of some of the things that I think we have to start having these conversations because this is really what's shaped a lot of what we look at. And so this is what I call the battle of equity and equality. Um, and so equity and equality are two very different things. You know, equity is basically like, you know, or um, is giving everyone the same opportunity to do things. So like Title IX, for example, we said, you know, there has to be equal funding in public school systems that's paid for female and male athletes. Or for, and, and so we have, you know, equal sports. You know, if a college wants to start a new sport, they basically have to look at, do they have equal participation and funding and all of those other things. Um, and so, but then, you know, equality and, or equity is making sure that we can do that where everyone has the same resources. And so we've, we have equality, but do we have equity? And I think that's where we have to kind of look at those things um, and look at that risk that it puts some of our athletes at um, by not having that. And so, you know, one of the things is, is that the females have, have, through the span of time, have been the weaker sex. So what's really interesting is when you look at sort of the Olympic experience here and looking at Olympic history, so the first, you know, like, before the modern games. The original Olympics were around 776 BC. Um, and at the first Olympic games, women were not allowed to compete at all. And in fact, women were not even allowed to attend if they were married. This is very interesting. Um, why that is, I don't really know. But they, and so if they attended the Olympic games or watched the Olympic games as a married woman, it was punishable by death. That's how severe this was. Um, and that if they were an unmarried woman and they wanted to perform in sports and do things, they could participate in the Hera Games, um, but they were not allowed to participate in the Olympics. Then you fast forward a long time in history to 1896, um, and that was the first modern Olympics. And women were banned from, from competing or participating in the first modern Olympics as well. Four years later, very interesting, it was very quick, um, because there were women participating in sports during this time. The first female athletes were allowed to participate, but it was very limited on on what things that they could participate in. And there were actually physicians at this Olympic games that were trying to ban um, women from participating and were trying to protest the Olympics from happening because it was unsafe, because women were not fit to be like, to compete at that level. And this was harmful to their bodies and to like, and to their well-being. Um, and then in 1928 is really when sort of like we had this launching point. So there was a Canadian athlete, um, Bobby um, Rosenfeld, um, who actually was a hockey hockey player, a, um, a track and field, um, and then also did some cycling. Um, was just a, a really phenomenal athlete. And she actually was the first one to compete in the Olympics um, in track and field and actually had four medals. Um, and so, um, and that was the first time that they could. But even with that, there was another athlete. So she got fifth in the 800 meter run. There was another female athlete that supposedly collapsed during the 800 meter run. And so female athletes were banned from participating in the 800 meters for like another like 30 or 40 years after that because of that one athlete that collapsed even though Bobby Rosenfeld got like fifth um, in the event and did just fine. Um, and that was because it was unsafe for women to be running that far, um, which is phenomenal. So, um, you know, when we look also at the equity issue, I think all of you remember this picture. <laughs> all of us were a little bit appalled and it gets a little bit worse than this too. So this was the picture that first like blew up all over social media at the NCAA for, um, um, tournament, basketball tournament last year. Um, so this was the women's weight room. Literally it had this rack of weights, this table and a bunch of yoga mats piled on top of it. And that was their like weight room for them to train while they were there. And if you remember, this was 2021 and they had the bubble. So like no one, 
tra no one traveled anywhere else. So these athletes that went all the way through the tournament were there for like a month. So, and that's all they had to train with initially. This was the men's weight room where they were at. Um, so the women were in Texas, the men were in um, Indianapolis. And so this was basically the men's, men's training room. And this is only a piece of the room. It was an entire like auditorium and, um, and just, you know, at the hotel, it was basically the entire like, you know, conference room. Um, and then, and that was for all of the women. And so obviously very quickly, um, the NCAA was like, oh, we just had a space issue, but it's interesting because literally a week later, this is what happened. And this space was miraculously found. Um, and this is the weight room that basically got set up for the women so that they had somewhere to train. And when you look at this, you know, I don't bring this up as a political issue. I really bring this up as an issue. If you have this for, you know, 20, 30 teams that are training for a month, like how do we not expect them to get injured? Like they can't train, there's nothing from a strength and conditioning standpoint for them to do. Um, there's nothing for them to warm up before their games. Like they have, you know, that is a huge amount of time that we've basically asked them. And so, and when we're like, they just get yoga mats so that they can go stretch. Clearly that kind of emphasizes the same thing about the, the perception that we have of women being these sort of delicate athletes that are, you know, aesthetically like pleasing and then male athletes that need all of the weights and, and strength and conditioning equipment. Um, and that plays into injury risk. Like I mentioned, you know, we know that having stronger core, stronger like leg muscles are really important, but if we don't provide the opportunity for them to do this, then we're not gonna actually have, we're gonna see those d d um, discrepancies in injury risk. And so is it really something that's physiological logic and anatomically like different between women or is it because we train them differently and the expectations and the opportunities for them are very different. And it doesn't just end there. The media has played a huge part in the equity issue with sports. Um, so when you look at tele television coverage of women's sports versus men's sports, and this has been talked about for the last 20 years and it has not changed much, unfortunately. Really, it's about three to 5% globally over ABC, NBC, you know, Fox, like all the major networks, it's pretty consistent at three to 5% of women's coverage versus men's coverage. And then when you look at the percentage of airtime on ESPN, this was in 2014, 2% of women, two and a half percent of both, like sort of not like, um, you know, non-gendered based um, sports and 95% of it is all male sports. Um, and so when you have that, it really sets up this problem of like what the priority is. And so when you look at funding, when you look at sponsorships, which is where most athletes make their money, it doesn't go to that side because that's not who's getting all the media and television coverage. And so we've got to change this in order to like have that equity issue addressed. The other thing is when you look at the media portrayal of women's athletes versus male athletes. So you look at kind of these pictures here, all the male athletes are like with their equipment, like they're like, you know, it's like strength and dish, you know, it's like you look at Russell Wilson, he's like, you know, all got his pads on, looks like, you know, you, you know, people are shooting, they've got their tennis racket. These are the women athletes. Like what sport do they even play? You wouldn't even know. And most of them, except right here, there's a tennis racket. It made it in there, but that's not the headline. It's how hot is, how hot is too hot? You know, like so <laughs> kind of negated the little tennis racket here. Um, and so when you look at sort of body dysmorphic issues, when you look at the mental health you know, constraints, this has nothing to do with them being an athlete. This has everything to do with what their body image is. And so this is also not, you know, helping them to get, you know, strength and conditioning equipment and have opportunities to do this, but this is how they can get money so that they can support themselves in, as an athlete. And so we really have to like target the media as, as having, a, having an issue in this. And then, you know, we can't not talk about the pay gap, which this is actually a good time to talk about the pay gap because actually like one of the sports has been the most progressive in that is actually one that just like came about just that we just dealt with even this morning. Um, sadly, no one got really paid very, very much this morning. But um, so when we look at basically um, the highest paid athletes in 2021. So the top 25 athletes, there is only one female that makes that list and she's number 12. Um, and that's Naomi Osaka um, and that's tennis. And she um, has very very nice and most of it is you know media sponsorships and other things and it's really because of media perception and other things but she's 60 million annually and she's just above um just to kind of give you perspective of who those athletes are um she sits just above um tiger woods um and so and then the top athletes are actually um um two um, soccer athletes and then, um, you know, LeBron James and other people that are kind of in there that we know. Um, 
we look at women's soccer, um, so this was a very, so this was a, a big publicized thing actually in 2014 and 2015 as well. Um, you know, the men's team made it to, a, they got 11th in the World Cup in 2014 and everyone was super excited and they were like, this is awesome, which was great. So $9 million is what the men's team got paid for being 11th place. A year later, we had the Women's World Cup. And I think most of you know this, but we won the World Cup. That women's team got $2 million. And so I think most of you are aware. Um, so this also got driven. Actually, there was a um, resolution that passed in Congress. So there's not a law, but there was a resolution that basically the women's team actually advocated for and the men's team supported them in doing this a lot and got a resolution with Congress passed last year that basically said that men's and women's athletes should be paid equally. And so some sports have taken that to heart because obviously it's not a law yet, it's a resolution. And one of those was soccer. So if those of you remember, in summer of 2021, there was a um, collective bargaining agreement with men's and women's soccer where every competition, the pot is split equally. So the women just got paid. Um, and they got paid actually quite a bit, which was actually the, f this, they are the first sport at that level to basically do that, which gives the women opportunity to have other places that they can train, to have other things um, and things that they need. Um, and so it's, this is amazing and this is awesome. And clearly our women's soccer program in this country does a lot for, for soccer just in general. And so it's been really awesome to see that and to see it follow through with the World Cup now. And so the men's and women's teams all got paid. Um, and so the women can use Use that to develop their program and to have youth development programs and to have strength and conditioning for those youth development programs and really build and continue to build the soccer. Um, so when you look at the WNBA, um, this is you know very interesting as well. Minimum salary for WNBA in 2015 was 38,000. So most of us actually make more than these professional athletes who, I mean, many of, some of you are athletic trainers or physical therapists who have worked with them. Their schedules are insane. Their travel schedule, like it is a huge commitment and they can't do anything else. And 38,000 is not a lot to live on when you like are, you know, from city to city and, you know, just don't have a lot and childcare, you know, many um, WNBA moms, uh, there's many moms. One of the things that WNBA did that was awesome was actually provided childcare and lets the kids travel with their mom, which is amazing. Um, and so their minimum salary Salary, um, now is 60,000. So it's definitely made great strides um, with an average salary of about 120,000. Um, and their super max base salary, so this is the most that any of them make, is 22, um, 221,000. Um, and it was 109,000 in 2015. So that's also bumped up. But just to put this in perspective, <laughs> The NBA, the mid-level for a team with the room under their salary cap, because theirs are done differently, which is how they've hid this a lot. Theirs is done with, they have, each team has their salary cap and then their salaries are within it. So it's kind of hard to find their salary data, but their mid-level um, for under that salary cap is 5.4 million. So that's not even the top of the end. That's the mid-level that's sort of in there when they don't, when they have room under their salary cap. So no one is really making like anything close there. Um, so um, I want to just touch on this really quickly and because we're getting close on time anyways, but definitely there are uniform differences. You know, women have breasts. Um, and so we have to talk about those because those actually have effects on performance as well. So there's really cool studies that have been done on sports profit. Um, and so those um, people that are women, especially they're, that are well endowed, will kind of talk to you about discomfort and other things, but it actually affects their performance as well. Um, so um, when you look at um, runners, for example, um, um, between 4.6 and 8.6 minutes, um, according to cup size, can be added to the time due to an unsupportive sports bra. So it doesn't sound like much, except when you're like a marathon runner, and that's like a huge amount of time. Um, and so, and this is because actually the excessive breast movement leads to shortening their running side, their running stride by about four centimeters. Um, and so if you add that up over the length of like, you know, 36 miles, you'll like, it definitely makes a big difference. And you're actually are using a lot more energy to do that. Um, and so this is definitely more noticeable in women who have larger breast sizes because there's gonna be more breast movement. Um, and so when you look at a, a woman who wears a 36 double D, they would finish a marathon almost 35 minutes behind a woman who wears a 36 A. And it's strictly because of that mo motion in their chest. Um, and so greater breast support has been associated with reductions in absolute and relative oxygen consumption. And so this is why it actually makes a difference. Um, and it's also um, associated with increases in running economy um, because they don't have to like take as many steps.
So this is just an example. This is the same women. Um, so this is actually Nike's like moderate um, support and stability. And so you can see how it like lifts the breast, kind of holds them up against the chest. This is their low level support. And so you see how it's just sort of saggy and it's just there. So this is gonna have a lot of motion. This has much less motion. There's also been some studies just done on comfort for women. Um, and so it's interesting because it kind of correlates the same way. Um, and so outcomes, um, you know, I think this is really the, where the important conversation comes in is sort of looking at, you know, I think we can't have this conversation without including, obviously there's the structural component of why we're, you know, lower extremity injuries are higher in women um, with the pelvis shape. There's the physiologic part of it with the ligamentous laxity and the hormonal regulations. But I think we also have to sort of talk about those social determinants and those training opportunities and funding and where that funding goes to like support um, training our athletes and training them similarly for th from a strength and conditioning standpoint as we do male athletes. And then I wanna just leave you with this picture. Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever thought about like why male and female gymnastics have different events. Um, it's one of the only sports that does that. And so you're like, why? And so I've asked the question. I actually looked into why the question is. This really has to do with actually when gymnastics first started. So if you look at even the two events that are the same, so floor exercise. If any of you have ever watched male gymnastics, it's basically like there is no music. It is all just tumbling and it's all power and strength. And if you look at female, it's all artistry and dance. And, um, and it's really because women are seen and viewed as these artistic athletes who have more flexibility. Um, and, and so it's the artistry of gymnastics on the women's side and it's the strength standpoint. What's very interesting is people have started talking about that you could probably take Simone Viles and ask her, because in the past they've been like, well, women can't do men's events because we don't have the upper body strength because most of our strength is all lower extremity. So they've started talking about because our new gymnasts and how we're now training gymnasts, which have been, are now power tumblers and power athletes, very well probably could do pommel horse and could do rings and hold those holds. And so it's interesting because there may be a shift that we might start to see as we sort of start to have this discussion because it's really, this is very much an issue of what we perceived our athletes to be and how we trained them and what our athletes have now become. And so I'll just leave you with that. And that is just some references and you guys will be able to get all of those eventually.